It is so good to see you. Thank you for the wonderful singing. Thank you, Brother Don, for doing a great job leading us in our singing. And thank you to all of you who are here tonight. I can't believe that we are almost finished with this gospel meeting. And you have just listened so very well. You've been so encouraging. And I just appreciate it so very much. I appreciate your love for the Lord, your love for His Word, and your love for the preaching of the Word of God. And thank you for being here each night, those of you who've been able to make it. And if you are visiting with this church family like me, thank you for being here tonight. I hope we can encourage you. I hope we can learn together as we study from the Scriptures. We really, really appreciate you being here. You are among friends, people who love you and want to encourage you in the Lord. But thank all of you for being here this evening. I want to begin this lesson by reading the first two verses of Acts 10. And then I want to drop down and read another section in this same chapter. And so in Acts, the 10th chapter, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says this, Now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort or the Italian band, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. Drop down now to verse number 24 of this same chapter. In verse number 24, the scripture goes on to say, On the following day he, and the he there is a reference to the apostle Peter, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius, this, was, this is the same Cornelius mentioned at the beginning of the chapter, Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, Stand up, I too am just a man. As he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him, and yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. That is why I came without even raising any objection when I was sent for, so I ask, for what reason you have sent for me? Why? Why am I here? What in the world am I doing here? You ever found yourself asking that question before. I suspect that there are several people in the Bible who probably asked themselves that question. For example, the Apostle Paul, he likely asked that question after initially arriving in the city of Philippi only to discover that God had called him to go to a place that had no Jewish synagogue and only a few women praying by a river. The Apostle Paul probably initially arrived in Philippi and asked the question of, why am I here? What in the world am I doing in a place like this? And then Philip the Evangelist? Philip the Evangelist in Acts chapter 8, he may have also initially asked this question before coming into contact with an Ethiopian eunuch on a deserted road that descended from Jerusalem to Gaza, and then based on what we just read here in Acts 10 and verse 26, the apostle Peter clearly asked that question upon entering the house of a man named Cornelius. Cornelius. Brothers and sisters, who was Cornelius? Well, based on the first two verses we read in this chapter, Cornelius was a centurion who lived in the prominent Roman city of Caesarea. He lived in a city called Caesarea Maritima, and he was a military man, like we may have some military men in the room tonight. And he was a good man, and he was a moral man, and he was a man who feared God. And he was a man who also led his family in the ways of God, and he helped God's people. He actually gave money to the Jewish people, and he was a man of prayer, and he was devout, and he was upright, and he was highly respected in his society, but, and this is a big but, he was a Gentile. But he was not Jewish, but he came from 
the other nations, and even though we are about 20 years removed, from the events of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when the church was first established, the apostle Peter still, he still has spent no time with a guy like this. He still had never even preached to a guy like this. He still has certainly never even gone in the home of a guy like this, and yet, here he is. Here is where God has led him. Here is where he realizes God wants him to be based on a vision he received from God on a housetop. God wanted Peter to specifically visit this man named Cornelius. In fact, God even had Cornelius send for Peter. And the question is, the question is why? Why? Why did God want this man Cornelius to send for Peter? Well, I want to suggest that there are at least four reasons. There are at least four important reasons why God wanted Cornelius to send for Peter. And the first reason why God wanted Cornelius to send for the Apostle Peter is because being good wasn't good enough. Being good wasn't good enough. I think we need to start with this particular point because for many people, for many people in the world today, this is a radical idea. This is a radical idea. I mean, you ask a lot of people in our time today, what does it take to be right with God? What does it take to go to heaven to be with God? You ask that question to people today, and what the majority of them are likely to say is all you got to do is be a good person. All you got to do is be a good person. You ever heard someone say that before? You ever heard someone suggest that if you want to be right with God, if you want to go to heaven to be with God, all you got to do is be a good person. For me personally, I've heard people say, say that a lot. I hear people say that all the time. Going back to the time when I was just a little boy going to funerals, I can remember standing around people and hearing them say, well, you know, I know this person has to be in heaven because they were such a good person. He was such a good person. She was such a good person. She would make the best pies and the best cakes and give them to people for free. He would give you the shirt off his back. She was always nice to people. She was always kind to people. I never heard her say anything unkind about anybody. He never missed a church service. He never missed a Wednesday night Bible class. He would always talk about prayer and talk about the need for prayer. He could quote all kinds of scriptures. He was such a wonderful husband. She was such a wonderful wife. They were just such wonderful parents to their children. You see, while most people reject universalism, and universalism is the belief system that in the end, everybody's going to be saved. Nobody's going to be lost. God's love won't allow anybody to be in hell. While most people reject universalism, they do believe this. They do believe that being a good person and doing a bunch of good works is enough to get your ticket punched to heaven. But I want you to notice how the sending of Peter to the house of Cornelius, that blows that notion away. It absolutely blows that notion away. I want you to go now back to the book of Acts. Look at chapter 11. Look at chapter 11. Because in Acts the 11th chapter, we're fast forwarding the story a little bit. After Peter is finished spending time with Cornelius and his family, after Peter preaches the gospel to Cornelius and his family, he goes back to Jerusalem, to the brethren in Jerusalem, and he tells them about what happened. He tells them about why God wanted him to be there. Because many of the Jewish brethren did not like that. They did not like the fact that Peter went to spend time with a Gentile. Now, they didn't necessarily mind him preaching to a Gentile. They really had a problem with him eating with them. There was a lot of racism in the first century church. That's just a fact. And so Peter has to explain himself. And he has to explain why he went to this man, this Gentile's house. And so he says in verse 12 of Acts chapter 11, in verse 12, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, told me to go with them. The them there is a reference to some men 
that Cornelius sent to Peter to bring him to, to his house. And so in verse 12, it says, The Spirit told me to go with them without misgivings. These six brethren also went with me, and we entered the man's house. And he reported to us how he had seen the angel. Cornelius saw an angel standing in his house saying, Send to Joppa and have Simon, who is also called Peter, brought here. Verse 14. And he will speak words to you by which you will be what? By which you will be saved. You and your household. Now, we've already established, we've already established that at the beginning of Acts chapter 10, when we're first introduced to Cornelius, this is a really good guy. This is a really good guy. This is the kind of guy you want to be a member at the Woodlands Church of Christ. This is the kind of guy you would want to be friends with. This is the kind of guy you would want your daughter to marry. This is a good guy right here. We've already established he's a good guy. He's a man of prayer. He's a given man. He's a devout man. He's a good leader of his family. I mean, when Acts chapter 10 opens up, he is clearly racking up all kinds of good deeds. And if being good and doing a bunch of good deeds was good enough to be right with God, then why in the world does he have to send for Peter? Why in the world does he have to do what verse number 14 of Acts 11 says he did? Why in the world did he have to still hear words by which he was going to be saved? Why did he have to do that? If being good was good enough to be right with God. You see, Acts 11 and verse number 14 shows us that while Cornelius was a good man who did a bunch of good works, he still wasn't a saved man. He still wasn't right with God. He was still, in fact, lost in his sins. That's what we can infer from that text. And do you know what that means practically? Practically, that means that being a good person can't save you. Being involved in a bunch of good works can't save you. Going to church every single Sunday, that can't save you. Reading your Bible every day, that can't save you. Praying three, four, five times a day, that can't save you. Giving to the poor, being nice, being kind, making pies and cakes for people, visiting the sick, being faithful to your spouse, being a good parent, paying your taxes on time. None of that stuff by themselves can save you. You see, while we certainly need to be obedient to God in regards to every one of those things, none of those things by themselves can save us. Good works couldn't, can't save us just like they couldn't save Cornelius. In fact, here's why they can't save us. The reason why they can't save us and the reason why they couldn't save Cornelius is because in Romans 3 and verse 23, the Bible says we're all sinners. Romans 3, 23, you know the verse, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When the Bible says all there, it means it. It means all. It means you, it means me, even means Cornelius. Cornelius, at the end of the day, no matter how much good he did in his life, he was a sinner. He was someone who had violated the law of a holy God. And because of that, he deserved something. He deserved death. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. Now, the death there in that context, it's not talking about physical death. You know, even innocent Precious, sinless babies. They die in this world every single day. That's not talking about physical death. That's talking about spiritual death. Because a person sins, they deserve to die spiritually. They deserve eternal separation from God. That's what Cornelius deserved because he was a sinner. But thankfully, the good news of the gospel is right between Romans 3 and Romans 6. It's in Romans 5. Where the Bible says that even though we're sinners and we deserve to be lost, God still loved us. In fact, God demonstrated that love by sending his son to die on a cross. And through the death of Jesus, we can be justified, reconciled and saved by his blood. Peter puts it this way in first Peter chapter one. If you go in your Bible, please, with me to first Peter chapter one, the same Peter, the same Peter who preached to Cornelius says this in first Peter chapter one. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 18. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 18, as Peter writes 
to people like in this room tonight, the vast majority of people in this room are Christians. And Peter has this to say to us. In case we want to become arrogant and puffed up with pride, thinking we can earn our salvation, Peter says in 1 Peter 1 and verse 18, knowing that you, you Christians, were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life, inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Peter says that when it comes to being saved, when it comes to being right with God, when it comes to going to heaven, merely being, quote unquote, good people, that's not good enough. Being involved in a bunch of good works, that's not going to earn our, our salvation. Getting to the end of our lives and making sure that our good deeds have outweighed our bad deeds, that's not going to get the job done. Peter says good works don't save us. Instead, the blood of Jesus is what saves us. The blood of Jesus is what redeems us. The forgiveness that is available to us through Jesus, that's what makes our salvation possible. In fact, think about this. Think about this. If we could go to heaven and be right with God just based on being quote-unquote good people and doing a bunch of good deeds, then why in the world did Jesus Christ have to die on the cross? If we could be saved by just being good people and doing a bunch of good deeds, being nice people and doing good deeds for others, we could be saved just by that. Why did Jesus have to leave being in the perfect presence of his father? Come into this world, this garbage dump called earth, live among sinful men, live a sinless life himself. Be rejected, spit on, mocked, ridiculed, have a crown of thorns beaten in his head, have nails driven in his hands and his feet, suffer to his last breath on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. If we could be saved by just being good people, then why in the world did Jesus have to go through all that stuff? That doesn't make any sense, does it? You see, those who suggest that being a good person it's all you got to do to get to heaven. You know, what else, you know what else they're suggesting? They're suggesting that Jesus died for nothing. They're suggesting that you can be saved apart from the blood of Jesus. They're suggesting that you don't need Jesus because you really can save yourself. That's what that means. And that's not why Peter was sent to Cornelius. Peter was sent to Cornelius. Because while Cornelius was a good man, doing all kind of good stuff in his life, he still needed to hear the gospel. He still needed to hear about Jesus. He still needed to hear words by which he was going to be saved. And so that's one reason. That's one reason why Peter was sent to Cornelius. He was sent to Cornelius because being good wasn't good enough. But a second reason why he was sent to Cornelius is because he was seeking God. He was seeking God. And I want to show you that going back to the text. Go back to Acts chapter 10, please. Go back to Acts 10, and let's pick up with verse number 3. So the first two verses of Acts 10 tell us about Cornelius' his character. They tell us about all these good deeds he had going on for him in his life. But then you get to verse 3. You get to verse 3, and then we start learning about what God has to say to him and why he knows about Peter and sins for Peter. So in Acts 10 and verse number 3, the Bible says, about the ninth hour of the day, he, Cornelius, clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius, verse 4, and fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, look at the language carefully, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel was, who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants, servants and a devout soldier of those who were his personal attendants. And after he explained everything to them, 
He sent them to Joppa. So the verse I want to focus in on, if you don't mind, is verse 4. I want to ask you to please notice carefully verse number 4. Notice how in that verse, an angel of God clearly states that God heard Cornelius. Do you see that? The Bible clearly says that God heard the prayers of Cornelius. God heard his prayers, even though at this time he's not a Christian. He is not a disciple. He hasn't even heard the words yet by which he was going to be saved. That's what the Bible says there. The question is, what can we learn from that? What can we learn from what the angel is saying there in that verse? Well, one thing we learn is this. One lesson we learn from that is the blind man's statement in John 9 and verse 31. That's not 100% accurate. You remember what that blind man said in John 9, 31? That man who was born blind, Jesus gave him his sight. And he says that Jesus has to be a man of God because God doesn't what? God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners. Brothers and sisters, that man's not inspired when he's saying that. That man's not under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he says that. In fact, if that's true, then what are we going to do with that right there? What are we going to do with verse 4? What are you going to do with that? That's a problem. Notice how here, Cornelius is a sinner. He's not a Christian. He has not yet had his sins washed away by the blood of Jesus, but God heard him. God heard his prayers. And why did God hear his prayers? Well, the reason why God heard his prayers is because God can do something you and I can't do. God can read hearts. He can read hearts. He was able to read Cornelius' heart. He was able to see that Cornelius had an honest heart. He could see that Cornelius was seeking the truth. He had a heart that could be converted, pricked, and touched by the gospel. God could see that. And I'm going to tell you something, that's powerful. That is powerful. That's powerful because it shows us how God looks at people outside the church. It shows us that God doesn't look at all these people outside the church who are engaging in good deeds and who want to be right with him and who are even praying to him every single day. He doesn't look at them and completely disregard them. He doesn't fold his arms up in heaven and roll his eyes and say, well, you know what? I don't care nothing about them. They're just going to have to find me on their own. I don't care about these people at all. God doesn't do that. He doesn't completely disregard people outside of the church. In fact, drop down to verse 34 of this chapter. Look at verse 34. Because Peter says something interesting in Acts 10, 34. When Peter starts to preach, when he gets to the house of Cornelius, It says in verse 34, opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality. But in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Some of your translations say the one who fears God and does what is right is acceptable to him. Acceptable to what? Acceptable to what? What does Peter mean when he says that in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him? Before I tell you what that means, let me first tell you what it doesn't mean. Let me first suggest to you that that language doesn't mean that everyone who fears God and does what is right is going to automatically be saved. It doesn't mean they're going to automatically go to heaven. I mean, if that's what it meant, then Cornelius didn't need to send for Peter. If that's what it meant, Cornelius didn't need to hear words by which he was going to be saved because he was already doing that. He was already fearing God. He was already doing a bunch of good deeds in his life. That's not what that language means. That language does not mean that anyone who fears God and does what is right, is automatically going to be saved. Instead, what it means is God is going to work to provide those people with an opportunity. It means that God is going to give these people an opportunity to hear and obey the gospel. It means that God is going to help honest, 
seekers find the truth. That's what that language means. And that's what God does for Cornelius. And maybe that's what God did with you. Maybe as you sit there tonight and think about your own journey, maybe you can think about a time in your own life when you were just like Cornelius. Maybe you can think about a time in your life when you were outside Jesus Christ. You didn't have a relationship with God. You didn't know God. You were walking around in spiritual darkness, but you really wanted to do what was right. You really wanted to serve the Lord. You really wanted to be right with God and do his will in your life. And God knew that. He knew that. He could search your heart and see what was in your heart. And so he providentially worked to bring you into contact with a Christian who could teach you the truth. And that Christian taught you the word of God and you obeyed the word of God. And tonight, guess what? You're here as a result of that. Tonight, you're a Christian. You're a member of the Lord's church. You're a disciple. You're truly on a path to heaven. You see, even today, even today, we got to understand God knows who all the Corneliuses are. He knows who they are. He knows where they are. And we need to be praying every day that God will use us to reach those people. We need to be praying every day that God will put us into contact with the Corneliuses. We need to be praying that God will bless us to find those people and that God will use us to be the people who will speak words to them by which they will be saved. That's why God sent Peter to Cornelius. Peter goes to Cornelius because... God knew he was seeking. He knew this man had an honest heart who could be touched by the gospel. In fact, that brings us to a third reason, a third reason why Peter is sent to this man. And that's because God wanted to emphatically announce to the world in a practical way that the gospel is for everybody. The gospel is for everybody. That is, in fact, why this story here, this story here in Acts 10, that is why this is such an important moment in human history. That is why this is such a critical conversion story in the book of Acts. You see, we got to understand, my dear friends, that up to this point in the book of Acts, the gospel's really only been preached to the Jews. Even though the church has been in existence for about 20 years, up to this point, the gospel has only been preached to people who were Jewish or half Jewish or they've been proselytized into the Jewish faith. It has not yet been preached to people like us. It has not yet been preached to people from the other nations, the people who are Gentiles. But when Peter arrives at Cornelius' house, that's about to change. Now the gospel is about to be preached to the nations. And that's what God always wanted. We see that as early as Genesis, the 12th chapter. You're familiar with the promises made to Abraham? One of those promises was that through someone coming in Abraham's family, God was going to bless all the nations. All the nations were going to have access to having a relationship with God through the Messiah who would come through the family of Abraham. That was God's will going all the way back to Genesis 12. And then go in your Bible to a few passages in the Old Testament, please, like Isaiah chapter 2 where 700 years, at least 700 years before the coming of the Messiah, the prophet Isaiah said these words in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse number 2. and Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it says now it will come about in the last days. That's the days of the Messiah, the days of the kingdom of God, the days of the new covenant, the days of the, of the, of the church. Now it will come about in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. And here's the key part. All nations, not some nations, not just the Jewish nation, all nations will stream into it. It's always been God's will for us to have a chance to be in his family. God's always wanted us as Gentiles. What a blessing that is. He's always wanted us. In fact, blow the dust off of the book of Hosea, one of the minor prophets. We go to Hosea chapter 2, and you go to Hosea chapter 2, and you look at verse number 23, and as God speaks through the prophet Hosea here, Hosea chapter 2, 
And in verse number 23, he says, I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, that's us, the Gentiles, they were not God's people under the old covenant. And God says there was going to come a day when I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they will say you are my God. Paul quotes this very passage in the book of Romans to make the point that God's always wanted the Gentiles. He's always wanted us to have a chance to be part of his family, to be adopted in his family and be heirs of spiritual blessings. Understanding that makes Mark 16, 15 even more powerful. When before ascending into heaven to sit at the right hand of God, what did Jesus say to his apostles? The last thing he said to them before he goes to heaven in Mark chapter 16 and verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel, not to some creation, to all of it, to all creation. You see the point. You see the point. God wants everybody. God wants all the nations. He wants me and he wants you. And the sending of Peter to preach the gospel to Cornelius, it proved that. It marked the moment in history, in human history, when the gospel officially began to be preached to people like us. It marked the moment in human history that demonstrated that Jesus was telling the truth in John 3 and verse 16 when he says God loves the world. Jesus was telling the truth when he says that he came to die for all people. God really does want all people to be saved. God really doesn't show partiality among men as Peter declares in Acts 10, 34. The gospel, the gospel is a message that's for everyone. The question is, are we willing to do what Peter did? The question is, are we as God's people willing to share the gospel with everyone? Are we willing to share the gospel with that co-worker we have who's a homosexual? Are we willing to share the gospel with those neighbors we have? who are living together and they're not married? Are we willing to share the gospel with our classmate or our teammate who is tra transgender? Or with the visitors who may come in here and they're poor and they're dirty and they smell bad? Or with the person that we see who may have green hair or blue hair or pink hair? Or maybe they dress immodestly. Or maybe they got tattoos and piercings in weird places. Or maybe we don't agree with their stance on political or social issues. Are we willing to preach the gospel in the way Jesus says it must preach, be preached? And that's to everybody. Or are we discriminating with the gospel? Or are we the kind of people who are only going to teach the gospel to the people we view as the ideal candidates, the people who are like Cornelius? The people we view as the good people, the people who have a good job and make a good six figure salary. And they're clean and they smell good and they are religious already and they believe in God and believe in Jesus and they look like us, talk like us, smell like us. They're already in scriptural marriages. They got big homes and white picket fences and 2.5 kids. They don't appear to have a lot of baggage in their lives. Are those the kind of people? Only the kind of people that we want to share the gospel with? If so, they were not being disciples. We're not being real disciples of Jesus. We're not being like Peter. The sending of Peter to Cornelius marked the moment when God emphatically demonstrated his desire for all people to be saved. He wants all people to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is why Peter was sent to Cornelius. But that leads us to one more thing we need to bring up very quickly and we'll be done. In addition to this moment, demonstrating that the gospel is for everybody. A fourth thing we learn from this moment is here we also see that baptism is for everyone. Baptism is necessary for everyone. Go back to Acts chapter 10 one more time, please. And one of the things we need to say about this chapter, and this is a very interesting chapter, and one of the things 
that makes it interesting, at least in my view, is all throughout this chapter, you got visions taking place. I mean, have you ever noticed that before? There are all kinds of visions in Acts chapter 10. I mean, Cornelius, the chapter begins with him seeing a vision of an angel. And then you got Peter, and Peter sees all kinds of visions. He sees all kinds of visions from God that were designed to inform him that God was working, and he's cleaning up the Gentiles, and he's about to bring them into the kingdom. In fact, after Peter arrives at the home of Cornelius, and after he begins to draw some conclusions as to why God wanted him there, he then begins to preach. He preaches the gospel to them. He preaches to them about Jesus. He tells them about how Jesus is God's anointed and how Jesus did good deeds all throughout his life and how Jesus suffered and he died on a cross and he was raised from the dead. Peter preached all these things to these Gentiles. But notice what happened beginning with verse 44. In Acts 10, beginning in verse 44, something happened to Peter that no preacher wants to happen to them. And that is, he's interrupted. No preacher wants to be interrupted while they're preaching. What preacher wants that? Well, that happened to Peter. He's preaching this great sermon. And in verse 44, Peter was still speaking these words. While he was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who were listening to the message. Okay, that's a good excuse right there. If I'm going to be interrupted by somebody, okay, Holy Spirit, you can do that. Holy Spirit interrupts him here. Nothing wrong with that. And then in verse 45, it says, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ then they asked him to stay on for a few days. Now go to chapter 11 very quickly. Quickly, look at verse 15. Because in Acts 11 and verse 15, as Peter is recounting this conversion case to the brethren in Jerusalem, he mentions this moment from Acts 10. So in Acts 11 and verse 15, it says, And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them just as he did upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave to them the same gift as he gave to us also after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they, the Jewish brethren in Jerusalem, when they heard this, they quieted down and they glorified God saying, well, then God has granted to the Gentiles, also the repentance that leads to life. So in both of these texts, Acts 10, Acts 11, you find the Bible talking about baptism. You see that. Baptism is being spoken of in the verse we read in Acts 10 and in Acts chapter 11. In fact, those texts actually talk about two different baptisms, two different baptisms. The first one was poured out directly from heaven. The first one involved the Holy Spirit's power being poured out directly from heaven on Cornelius and all those in his household while Peter was preaching to them the gospel. When that happened, the Gentiles were then able to miraculously speak in tongues. That is, they were able to miraculously speak in actual foreign languages that they had never formally been taught. When that happened, Peter says in Acts 11 and verse 15 that he remembered the same thing happening when the church first began. He remembered the same thing happening in Acts chapter 2. He remembered the same thing happening in Jerusalem to himself and the other apostles on the day of Pentecost. Peter says that when that happened to the Gentiles, he knew what God was saying. He knew what God was declaring. He knew that God was announcing that the Gentiles could be saved and forgiven by Jesus in the same way as the Jews. That's why in verse number 47, the Bible says, Peter says, no one can refuse water for these people to be baptized. 
That's why he says, that's why the Bible says he ordered them, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 10 are the only two places in the Bible where you find the Holy Spirit baptism being performed. Acts 2 and verse 10 are the only two places in the Bible where you find that baptism, and in neither case was it for the purpose of gaining salvation. And neither case was it for the purpose of receiving forgiveness of sins. Instead, in both cases, it served as a sign. It served as a sign that the Jews could be saved through Jesus in Acts 2. And if the Gentiles could be saved through Jesus in Acts chapter 10. But if both groups were going to be saved through Jesus, if both groups were going to receive the blessing that the sign pointed to, that they were going to have to have their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. They were going to have to call on his name. They were going to have to call on the Lord's name by being baptized in water for the remission of sins. That's why Peter said to those people in Acts 2 and verse 38, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. That's why here in Acts 10 and verse 47, he orders these Gentiles to be baptized in the name of Jesus that's why Saul of Tarsus was told in Acts 22 and verse 16 to arise and be baptized, having your sins washed away. That's why Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. That's why the Bible is consistent on this point. In fact, I want to show you one more scripture very quickly, and then we'll get ready to close. And it's in the book of Ephesians. We went to Ephesians yesterday. And we pointed out how in Ephesians 4, in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about us having a common hope. We talked about that. We talked about hope yesterday. Well, there's something else that Paul talks about here that we need to emphasize for this particular lesson. And so in Ephesians 4 and verse 4, he says there's one body. One body. That's the church. The universal body of saved people. And one spirit. Just you were also called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I want to key in for the purpose of this lesson, verse number five. I want you to notice how by the time Paul wrote this letter, and he wrote the Ephesian letter in about 61, 62 AD, somewhere in there. And by the time Paul wrote this letter, about 30 years after the church was first established, he says there was only one baptism in force. There was only one baptism by this time that was being administered that had God's approval. And the question is, what was that one baptism? Well, I submit to you that the one baptism that Paul is speaking of in this verse is not the baptism that served as a sign. It is not the baptism that served as a sign that the Jews could be saved through Jesus and that the Gentiles could be saved through Jesus. Instead, it is the baptism that Cornelius and his family were ordered to submit to after Peter figured out what the sign meant. It is the baptism performed by disciples. It is the baptism in water for the forgiveness of sins. That's the one baptism of Ephesians 4 and verse 5. And that shows us that water baptism is necessary. It is necessary. It was necessary for Cornelius and his family. It was necessary for those Jews in Acts chapter 2. It's necessary for you. It's necessary for me. It's necessary for all people to have their sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. Now, what I just want you to see is there's a lot going on here. But there's a reason why it all got started. There's a reason why God wanted an apostle to go to the house of Cornelius. Cornelius needed to send for Peter because he needed to understand that being good wasn't good enough. And because God knew this man was seeking, and because God wanted the world to know that the gospel is for everyone, and not just that, but baptism and water for remission of sins. That's also necessary for everyone.
These are some of the reasons why Peter was sent to this man. And the question is, what about you tonight? The question is, as you sit there in that pew on this Tuesday night, do you sit there and realize that you need to do what Cornelius needed to do? Do you realize that even though you may be doing a lot of good deeds in your life, none of that is going to earn you salvation? None of that is going to merit God's grace. You need to submit to God on His terms by believing in His Son, by acting on the words of the gospel and confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of your sins, and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins, just like Cornelius and his family did 2,000 years ago. That's what you need to do if you're not a Christian. I praise you with all of